Hi, I'm Ryan Harris. Tonight on Cricket Legends, when a teenager is described by Dennis Lilly as a once in a generation bowler, there's a lot to live up to. But DK was right. And despite some injury breaks, that teenager retired at 34 with 313 test wickets, fourth on the all-time list of Australian bowlers. He's known as the big dog, and he struggled without me bowling at the other end. His name is Mitchell Guy Johnson, and he's a cricket legend. Well, welcome, Mitchell. Nice to be here. I want to start 17 years ago when I got a call from Brian Friedman, the manager of the Australian Under-19 team in England, saying, you've got to go to the Brisbane airport to meet a young kid who's come from nowhere. His name's Mitchell Johnson. I don't think he's ever been interviewed. And I met a young lad there who was looking at his shoes as I was talking to him, and he was so shy. <laughs> and I was just going to say, what's your memories of that Mitchell Johnson? Yeah, very shy. Uh, I, I do remember that. And I probably had a bit of a different accent, the, the Townsville slang, as my <laughs> wife called it. So, yeah, that's something that's probably definitely changed a little bit. But, yeah, um, you know, growing up and, um, you know, I played a lot of tennis and, and other sports. And I guess that whole situation for me was um, really new and exciting and something I'd never experienced before. And, um, yeah, I was, I'd never been in the spotlight before. When you retired, it was said of you that you didn't really find cricket Cricket found you, and it was quite interesting, wasn't it? Because they saw the potential, didn't they? Dennis Lilly, and they put the speed gun on you, and it all sort of just escalated, didn't it? It did escalate, yeah. I mean, I missed out on all the, all the, the trials, cricket trials, because I was playing tennis at the time, and tennis was coming first for me. It was, it was always number one, and, yeah, I'd always miss out on the cricket trials, and I remember my cricket club, uh, Wanderers, back in Townsville, they'd always push for me to, to go to these trials, but... Yeah, I left school, six months out of school, and I got the, the call to go to a fast bowling camp uh, in Brisbane, and, you know, it, uh, it really was a whirlwind. And you were famously discovered bowling in your father's golf shoes, and they weren't the golf shoes of today, were they? They were the old clod hoppers. I can only imagine how hard they were to bowl in. Yeah, I mean, I was so used to bowling on AstroTurf you know, as a junior, and, and then I got the call up around 16, I think, to, to play A grade, and... I didn't have any cricket spikes, so yeah, I borrowed Dad's uh, golf spikes, and yeah, I don't remember bowling in them. Um, I think if I did bowl, and I would have probably injured myself. But um, yeah, look, the club was really helpful, and they they looked after me and, and, and gave me some spikes. Mitchell, how challenging was it for you not having that junior education in the game? Because you basically learned the game on the run, didn't you, at senior level? All of the pitfalls, all of the setbacks, it must have been challenging. Yeah, I, I had to do it on the run, really, and, um, you know, it was good experience for me, and, and, you know, there was highs and lows throughout my career, and, um, you know, I learnt a lot about, about myself and about cricket um, out in the middle, um, really, so, yeah, look, I, I did miss all those opportunities to, to, to learn the game at a younger age, um, but, look, oh, I feel like it's made me who I am. I want to now go to the end of your career, the day you retired. Like, at some point in a man's life, he's playing one minute, then ten minutes later he's retired. The actual moment when you thought, no, I'm done. The actual moment. Um, it, was, it was really... It had been a bit of a process for me. I'd been thinking about it after the World Cup, uh, where I was going to head in one-day cricket. Uh, and it was on my mind for, for a little while there, so... It's something that, um, you know, it wasn't going away, the thoughts. And, look, I, I came to that Perth test and um, got the ball in my hand and, and I just felt like I, I didn't want to be there. So didn't have that, that killer instinct anymore, that aggression. Um, you know, that got me to where I am. And, um, yeah, I just lost all, all motivation for it, that hunger. Was it true that you actually shed a tear after play one of the days of the Perth test? Yeah, I think Brett Lee caught me. Um, you know, I, I rang up Jess and, and, and spoke to her, said, look, I'm done, I'm finished. And it was really hard to, to t tell her that. Um, but she was really happy for me and it definitely brought a tear to my eye. And, um, yeah, look, it's, it, cricket's been my life. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was a difficult... It was still a difficult decision um, to, to say, look, I'm, I'm finished, I'm completely done. Um, but it was the right decision, it made me happy. Because the interesting thing is, like, you're so much more sophisticated than that boy we saw at the airport at age 17, but you've always been quite a, a not a soft lad, a sensitive lad, a and have you had to battle against that in some ways to be the, the rampaging quick? 
Uh, look, on the field, I felt like I've always been very competitive and I've always wanted to win and uh, I get that, you know, that fast bowler meanness about me. Um, you know, it's been up and down, you know, I've had, had those moments in 09 where I was in England and, and, and copping a barrage and um, I guess I didn't handle it the way I would have liked to have, but in saying that, it was a, uh, an experience for me and I, I learnt from it. So that just made me a, a better cricketer and, and a better person in the end. Did you ever find those two parts of your personality, the fire-breathing fast bowler and the sensitive guy rubbing against each other? Yeah, look, I feel like I've still had that sense of, uh, sensitivity now. Um, you know, I think I've just had more experience and, and I've learnt to deal with it. When I, when I first started, I definitely wanted to hide away from it all. And um, But being a fast bowler, it's, it's about being in the face of the opposition and, and, and being angry and, and aggressive. And, um, you know, I learnt that along the way. And um, it's a great experience that I've learnt. And, you know, hopefully I can take that on into to my future. What about the torment you suffered uh, from the Barmy Army? And, and it, it seemed to at times rattle you, although we never really found out how much. Like, you sort of, you, you know, you never really bared your soul to us. Looking back, how much did it? Yeah, um, constant barrage from the, the Barmy Army. It definitely rattled me. Um, and I, I guess those are the things that you don't want to admit when you're playing because it just gives more ammo. So, look, it, in 09, it was... I'd been performing well and then came over there with a, a high hopes and I probably became a bit too relaxed um, when I got there and, and thought it was all just going to happen and yeah, it sort of didn't happen that way and uh, the crowd really, really got to me and um, you know, when it's a constant uh, hammering from the from the, the Barmy Army and, and I guess the media and um, you know, people around, it's um, it's really hard to, to focus when that's happening and look, I found a way to, to get through that and it was just a... I guess I uh, have that little song on my head or, you know, that being just thinking positive um, thoughts um, and it definitely helped. A song in your head, what was that? Did you, something to, to sort of brighten <laughs> you, bring a smile to your face, what was that? Yeah, there was a few songs that I had and, and one of them reminded me of, of my little daughter and um, it was a Frozen song. Um, so I let it go. Um, I can't believe I'm admitting that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, look, it, it definitely put a smile on my face. It, it, it took all the bad thoughts out and um, I was able to just... Uh, go out there and enjoy myself. Speaking of your daughter, before your greatest summer, you turned up at a Brisbane Heat launch and uh, you were showing photos of Rubica to Chris Hartley and Chris said, Mitchell Johnson will kill him this year because he's happy off the field. And he said, there is, there, there's not two Mitchell Johnsons. It has to be the one guy. Unlike Warney, who could, who could soak it up and then perform. Was that true? Like, you had to have balance in your life to perform well? Yeah, I, I believe so. And, and once I found that balance and... I guess it was that belief in myself as well and, and just really being happy with what was going on in my life. Um, you know, that was definitely a big thing for me. And, um, yeah, look, uh, the second part of my career, is, is I definitely had that, that right balance and I really enjoyed myself. You'll always be remembered for your 37 wickets against England. What was it like bowling, you know, with the, putting the fear of God into them? I think there's more to it than 37 wickets but uh, into my career. But, um, yeah, look, I, I definitely will be remembered for that series. Um, but, yeah, look, I think as a fast bowler, um, I remember watching Kurtley Ambrose bowl and, and, and seeing, uh, I guess, the, his demeanour, his, his uh, aggression. He, he looked like he wanted to win. Um, he was right in their face. And I guess that's something I tried to take into my game. I think it took me a little while uh, as I was learning the game, but um, I finally got there and, and I felt like yeah, that Ashes series was, was something really special for me and, and for the team. Um, you know, to come out and win 5-0 um, the way we did, um, it, it re we really did take it to them. And, and personally, to go out there and bowl the way I wanted to bowl was, was the big, big thing for me and a great achievement. I want to talk about Jonathan Trott, who, of course, went home after the first test. You dismissed him twice, suffering some form of nervous breakdown. But the English all reckon it started a few months earlier in a one-day series in England when you hit him on the grill with a short ball and he, it was just too good, too quick for him. And he almost went home and overtrained to compensate for him and stressed himself to the max. Can you remember that ball in England? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to talk about that as well because I don't know him personally and, and off the field what's on, going on in his life. So, um, look, it's, 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 it's something that I do remember, uh, that ball in, in England. And I remember it because I went over there to, to prove a point um, and, and show that I could handle the, the crowds over there and play well in their conditions. And that's what I really wanted to do. And I do remember bowling at Edgebaston on a slowish wicket um, and, and, and hitting him in the grill. And 
it really it really lifted me. Um, you could see something in his face that that worried him, and look, I think that definitely dragged over into the Ashes series back home. And I think the first ball I did bowl to him was a short ball, and he he squared up to it. So um, we knew we were onto something. You knew you were onto something, and. Months later, Kevin Peterson released a book saying that the English were terrified in the dressing room at the Gabba. Could you sense that? I'm not sure you can listen to every word that, that uh, <laughs> KP says, but, um, yeah, look, uh, you could get a sense of, of something. Um, yeah, there, it was something, something special, something different. I think definitely their tail didn't want to be there. Um, you know, we, we made a pact to really go after their tail and, and I think we did that the whole series. We, we didn't let up and... You know, when they're, I guess, a little bit worried about what's coming towards them, um, they're going to not focus so much on their, their job to do, which is bowling. So, you know, that was something that we were really um, happy that we um, did and, um, you know, it really worked for us. I guess one of the most mysterious moments of your career was when you were dropped for the Homework Gate saga in India. You were given a, a chore to fill out by Mickey Arthur. You didn't do it and you're ruled ineligible for the next test. I understand you were really furious, is that correct? Yeah, who wouldn't be? You miss a, a, a test match for your country, um, playing overseas in a, a, a tough series. Um, yeah, it was, it was very disappointing, uh, the whole situation. Um, how did you find out? Like, when did they, who said to you, Mitchell, you've been banned for a test? Like, how did it happen? Yeah, well, I mean, a few of us, we just totally forgot, like, that was, that was it, really. We just totally forgot that we had to, to do this. And, um, yeah, the, I think it was the, the next morning after it was due, we were called into a meeting, uh, a few of us, and, um, yeah, basically walked in. And I think I saw Usman Khawaja walk out and he looked pretty distressed and, and upset and um, walked in and, yeah, we, we sat down and told, yeah, you're not playing the next, te next test match. And, um, yeah, I just was blown away by it. Uh, I didn't... Didn't really register straight away, but uh, I think it sort of registered later on when I had a net session and, and went out there and just tried to bowl as fast as I could. So it was, it was disappointing. Yeah, that's an interesting net session because you bowled to Philip Hughes, didn't you? And I, I understand, you, you know, you really threw the kitchen sink at him, as you did in the nets, but that memory stayed with you, didn't it? And apparently after Phil died, you just reflected on that. Is that true? Yeah, I did. I, I reflected on it and I... I I felt uh, extremely um, saddened by it and the whole situation and um, just sort of thinking about it, um, you know, I was, I do remember apologising to, to him and um, uh, Glenn Maxwell because they pretty much copped the brunt of it and, and it was something that I, I did do a lot of. I, I did practice my short ball and I, I did train the way that I would play um, and the guys knew that and I think a lot of guys would love that challenge uh, or did love that challenge but yeah, look, it was um, a very selfish moment for me and, and it's something that, yeah, oh, I don't regret, but I just felt it probably wasn't the right thing to do at the time. And it stayed with you, didn't it, after Phil's death? Some people felt that it changed your approach to fast bowling? Yeah, definitely. I, I hit Virat Kohli in, in Adelaide and um, the reaction there was a... a, a, a it was a tough moment and I was just I wanted to make sure he was okay and then once I knew he was okay I, I didn't really get on with it to be honest I, I sort of put the short ball away for a little bit and didn't really bowl it with any any meaning um, I built my game around that you know the Ashes series before that it was built around intimidation um, and I went away from that um, I think the last part of my career the last year or so it's I probably went away from it. And, and when I did bowl it, it wasn't with any real meaning. Your game had changed, hadn't it? It definitely changed, yeah. And, and I guess it's more intimidating. Like I, try, I think that's what fast bowling's all about and has been um, all about. It, it's, it's being intimidating as a fast bowler. I watched Brett Lee I show a back tar. Um, you know, you watch those guys and how intimidating they were. Um, they had the ball in their hand, they just wanted to bowl fast, and that's all I wanted to do. But it definitely changed the way I thought afterwards. Why didn't Mickey Arthur work as Australian cricket coach? What was the problem there? Um, look, it's a good question. I think coaching these days is all about being a good mentor and, and knowing your players. And look, I think maybe that's where it sort of fell apart a little bit. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard question to, to answer, but um, 
look, I think at that time it was just a lot going on. We had a lot of changes in the team and, and, and things weren't sort of going our way and uh, when things aren't working well and there's little off-field off things happening, it, it all just comes crashing down and that's what happened. There's a feeling that there'll never be another Mitchell Johnson. Like, can't, you floated in from outside the system and you had a lot to overcome, didn't you? Like, as a young kid, your mum and dad separated when you were at a vulnerable age, weren't you, a te young teenager? And that would have been tough to deal with, wouldn't it? Yeah, there's a lot going on and, um, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, at a young age when, you, when your parents uh, divorce, it, it's very upsetting and I guess I didn't really understand it all, but... Um, Look, I have a lot of love for my fa from my family and they've always been supportive of, of what I've done and um, I hope there is a, another Mitchell Johnson out there. I think there will be. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of special talent out there and, and I'm sure they'll, they'll find someone. We've got some you know, great guys coming through now and I'm sure there'll be some really special kids coming through. And, and Ricky Ponting in his book made an interesting comment about you. He said, I've never seen a better athlete or play with a better one than Mitchell Johnson or someone who had least confidence. And we never really saw that that lack of comp confidence per se, but it's a big statement from him. Yeah, I think it's true as well. The the the, the confidence side of things, um, not so much the athlete type thing. It's it's um, you know it's it's always great to have someone like Ricky talk you up like that. But um, yeah, look, from a, a confidence kind of type of thing, it's um, definitely something I never had when I was growing or going through this, uh, the Australian setup. Uh, um, you know, I was always probably questioning myself whether, whether I was good enough and um, I never really felt like I was a, you know, a real fast bowler um, up until the last little part of my career. So, um, yeah, it, it definitely, once I got that, that balance and that belief, um, it, things definitely changed for me. Isn't it amazing though, like Dennis Lilly at 17 said, this guy's a once in a lifetime fast bowler and yet you took probably 13 years to believe it, didn't you really? Yeah, um, and I'm... I'm happy that it took that long. I mean, I'm happy with my career and how it's panned out. Um, I think it's, for me, it's perfect. Um, you know, I've had, had my ups and downs. I've, I've gone through all those struggles and it's made me a better person, like I've said before. But, um, yeah, I think when someone puts those tags on you, it's, it's a little bit at the time I think it was something that I didn't understand and then once I understood it, then I probably expected it to happen. Um, so you go through all those kind of things throughout your career and, I've really enjoyed it. On your last tour of England, when Brad Haddon was dropped, you, you, you took it quite personally. Like, you, you, were, you were quite upset. Is that true? Yeah, I think we all were for the, because of the situation. And, and he's a good mate of mine as well. But, um, look, he was doing what was right for his family and, and we all respected that. And, and we, we all just thought he'd just come straight back in. And, um, look, I'm not a selector and I'm... I don't select the sides, but um, look, we all thought that he deserved that, that chance. Um, it seemed to rock the team? Yeah, look, it did at the time, um, but we all moved on from it. And, and, and to, to Brad's credit, he wanted us to, to forget about it and just go out there and play cricket. Um, that's all he wanted. He wanted Australia to, to do the best that they could. And um, he, he didn't, he tried to make it uh, as not a big deal as what it was. It was, I think it was all blown up a bit too much in the end, but he just wanted us to go out there and play cricket. What about some of the batsmen that you have hit over the years, and Graham Smith in particular? In the space of a few months, you broke both of his pinkies, and uh, they were big moments, were they? Weren't they? He, he was a big wicket. Yeah, he's a big player, he's a captain, and, and their team look, looked up to him. Um, the first time was in Sydney, I think it went off a crack and, and came back and hit him on the finger, and he showed great courage to come out and, and try and bat at the end of that match and, and save the game for his team and. Uh, then to, to do it over on their turf um, in Durban. Uh, quite, and that was a, a really big match for us as well. It was to win the series. Um, and that's, you know, they're special moments, those, those series away. But, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it was that ball up into the sort of rib cage, the, um, you know, the, the armpit um, that he sort of felt uh, that he struggled with, or I felt that he struggled with a little bit. And, um, like I said, if you, if, at that stage, if you can't get him out, then um, you can try and do something else. What about Dennis Lilly's influence on your career, Mitchell? You, you did once say that uh, he got you to grab a ball and run through the streets of Perth with it until it became a part of you. That was a novel idea, but it just seemed to work. 
Yeah, um, I, I basically used to run with my arms down, uh, down by my side and, you know, that wasn't natural to me. And, um, you know, we, we worked on that uh, and, and I would go to the park at late in the evenings but it was probably more dark than anything um, and do some drills down there with a ball in my hand. So, yeah, that did happen. Um, and I did run into a, a, a Chad Morrison who used to play AFL football and uh, he was doing some personal training down at the park and he sort of looked over and was a bit confused <laughs> at what was going on but realised it was me and um, yeah, he had a bit of a joke with me. But, um, yeah, look, it, it, it got me um, running more upright. Um, you know, I had a good rhythm with my run-up and, and I, was, I was hitting the crease the way I wanted to hit the crease. And I guess your involvement with Lily poses this question. Could you have done a Dennis Lilly, cut your pace and become a sort of a master of, of subtlety in this, or were you just the out-and-out -out speed merchant that, that had to be what you were? Yeah, I, I don't think I could have done that. Um, and, and Brett Lee said the same thing to me when we were playing together, and he said, the day I can't bowl fast, I don't want to bowl. Um, so I, I think I'm in that same uh, that same boat as, as Brett Lee. I, was, I just wanted to bowl fast. Um, you know, I spoke about it. Uh, after England, um, this Ashes series, uh, to Dennis uh, about about all that stuff and, and he mentioned it again and I was just, in the back of my mind, I just knew I wanted to bowl fast and if I couldn't do that, then uh, that was me. Did flat wickets kill you, Mitchell? Like, there, there was a whole series of them in Australia and, you know, it's funny, I can tell by the look on your face you're thinking, actually, they did, but will I confess to it? <laughs> yeah, I mean... All I ever wanted in the game of cricket and what I loved about the game was the, the, the fair contest. So between bat and ball, um, if you got a good wicket that was a good cricket wicket where you had a little bit early in it, a bit of bounce, a bit of pace, um, and then it just, over time, it deteriorated. The spinners came in towards the end. Um, I just wanted a, a fair wicket. Um, I think at times we, we probably didn't get that as a bowling unit, but the thing was I, I really enjoyed those challenges as well. Um, you basically, you've got a wicket, that's what it is. You've got to go and try and get 20 wickets. Um, so I enjoyed those challenges. I think towards the end, I, I lost that love for it. I would have loved to have seen you a week after you retired. You're sitting on the couch watching the pink ball test. Now, what were your emotions? Because it was such a sudden exit, wasn't it? So were you thinking, oh, give me that ball, look at it swing under lights, or were you thinking, nah, very happy? Yeah, look, I... I I was very happy. I was very, very happy sitting on the couch watching the guys go out there and do their thing. Um, I started to feel a little bit like a, uh, <laughs> like a, I wanted to get involved a little bit. I was starting to, um, I wanted one of the boys to to go pretty hard at the the debutant um, Santana. Um, I wanted them to, to go pretty hard at him, and, and I didn't understand why they weren't. But um, <laughs> I started to to scream at the telly a little bit, and then I decided to just relax, let the boys do their job. So um, yeah, look, I. I I know I made the right decision. Um, the guys are out there and, and, and enjoying themselves and I just wasn't enjoying myself. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed watching the game from, from afar. Mitchell, what about Ryan Harris? It, it always looked as if your game went up half a notch when he was playing. There was just something there, wasn't there, between you? Yeah, I think so. And, and, and no, well, there was, definitely. And um, he, he made sure to remind me when he retired. Um, watching me play afterwards, he, he sent me a couple of cheeky little messages saying, well... I think you need me back there, mate. Your averages are going up. So, Did you um, miss him? I did, yeah. Um, he was a guy that just put in for us and um, was such a great team man and great mate. Um, so he's, he was definitely missed um, through that Ashes series for us. It, he just did a job uh, and would do it all day, all day long. And what about Ricky Ponting's influence on your career? I know you were uh, paired with him in the boot camp uh, in the Sunshine Coast and it, it just set off something inside him that I think he wanted to care for you and mentor him. And, and almost immediately, you, you, you lifted almost. Yeah, that boot camp, the famous boot camp. Um, yeah, I, I had to basically boss him around um, at one stage during that camp. I, I had to take over as leader. And I remember that feeling of thinking to myself, I've just got into the Australian team and I'm supposed to boss the, the captain around. So I made sure I, I was very careful. But he, he sat me down and said, look, this is what you need to do, you, this is part of it, you do what you need to do, you lead us and um, we'll follow. So, he, yeah, from day one, I think um, there was a special bond. And you just caught some of the big players in Australian cricket, like Warney, didn't you, who on the boot camp took his fags along, didn't he? Broke protocol, yeah. no-one else was allowed to. Can you remember that, mate? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I remember the boys talking about it and they all they saw was a red glow um, out of his uh, sleeping bag. So... 
Um, yeah, it, was, it was quite a, quite interesting. Um, yeah, but I, I, I guess one of the memories of, of, of Warney also was he sat me down and made sure that I had a good signature, an autograph. So <laughs> we're in Sydney after or during the, the, the Ashes series there that we won 5 nil, and he sat me down and said, your, your autograph is rubbish. We need to work on it. So basically sat me down and uh, we, we came up with a new one. Don't worry about your outswinger or anything. No, the autograph. He was us. more worried about the autograph. Um, he, he did not want to borrow me in the nets, so he was happy for me to sit there and pen to paper. <laughs> now, Mitchell, we've spent a lot of time analysing you, but I want you to analyse yourself. <laughs> you put yourself here where I am and you say, all right, here's what I thought of Mitchell Johnson. This is why he's... His good days were good and this is why his bad days were bad. Over to you. Oh, well, um, yeah, look, I think for me it was just all about confidence and belief and, um, you know, I had those ups and downs throughout my career and I think it all came down to that belief and, um, you know, I'm really confident about leaving the game now and, and really happy with what I've left. Um, I think I've been able to be a good role model to the, the younger generation and, you um, you know, that was probably one thing that I felt like um, I was leaving behind a little bit was, you know, you know, the Starks and the Hazelwoods and um, the Pattinsons and I really wanted to nurture those guys through. But, um, yeah, look, I'll just hopefully I've been able to um, lead by example and um, do a great job for my country. And what's the one thing you'll miss about the game? The banter. <laughs> um, no, there's a lot. I mean, but I think it's... With who? Thing. Who's the banter king? Who, who's the bloke you think, oh, I miss his wisecracks? Um... I, th I think it was probably, I used to give it to a lot of the boys, to be honest, so they probably won't miss me too much. But um, I didn't mind with Davey Warner, you have a bit of, bit of, um, bit of banter with him. And, but it was more around the bowlers again. Like we had that, that cartel, that bowling cartel and that special bond. And, um, you know, we, we really had a lot of fun um, and enjoyed ourselves. So, um, you know, that's going to be something that I'll miss. And, but, you know, there'll be times where we can catch up in the future and, and talk about the game and, and what we did in the game. Well, Mitchell, it's often said that great fast bowlers are never forgotten. They, they leave a mark on the game that people will be looking at in 100 years. You've done that, and I can't believe that the boy who was bowling in his dad's golf shoes has come all that way. You should be proud of your career. You're a cricket legend, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Crash. Cheers.